All right, class, welcome to episode seven of A Moment of Science with Mr. Solis. Uh, we have Mr. Quintero back from down the hall, and we have Miss Saucedo, sixth grade ELA. Would you like to introduce yourself, Miss Saucedo? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Mrs. Salcedo. Um, I'm, I'm also from down the hall. I teach sixth grade ELA, um, and I teach the GT and pre-AP classes as well. And um, what can I say? English teaching is basically my life. That was my major. It's my passion. I read. I write. That's that's what I do. Nice. All right. So um, one thing that I really like about ELA is the fact that you guys are all about stories. Do you guys... I'm not quite sure like what the teaks are. So do you guys read a lot of books or is sixth grade more about like grammar? Like I don't really know what sixth grade ELA is all about. Like grammar, ugh. Um, <laughs> as an English teacher, grammar is not my favorite thing. But uh, yeah, so that's a good question because our teaks actually just changed like a year ago. And yeah. I like the direction they're changing in. Obviously we read a lot. Um, we have to mix it up though because there's so many different kinds of texts you can read. Lots of stories, obviously, but what I think is cool about ELA myself is that I can integrate pieces of history, pieces of science, because um, I really like all the subjects a lot, and so it's kind of neat to try to pull in those other subject matters in, and that way I can catch maybe my kids who don't just only like stories, maybe they want to know more about something in science or something in history. Um, we do some writing. We're trying to prep kids because by seventh grade, they have to be able to, you know, write for their star test. So we yeah. work on writing a good deal. Um, but something new to our teaks is, is conversation and being graded on that. I don't know if the kids talked with y'all very much about that this year. It was really different um, teaching that. Uh, we had to find a way, and it's not easy, to grade how people talk to each other in a conversation and keep track of it all <laughs> because yeah. that was real quick. <laughs> so, um, and that was a challenge, but it, it's really amazing to watch how the kids um, really rise to that challenge. They're, they're given um, kind of like a, a general idea of what they're going to have to talk about and they have to be able to be prepared for it. It's not just a random conversation. It's, it's more like, um, a planned, prepared conversation, but they right. still have to be able to um, like defend their own opinions. And it's cool to hear the things that kids will say in those conversations. So that's one of my new favorite things about teaching English is actually grading that uh, discussion. So now, as far as stories go, do y'all have a lot of science fiction or any type of science uh, books that y'all get into? Good question. Um, so. Ugh. That's not, there's not an easy answer to that. We also got brand new text. We got brand new everything. We got brand new textbooks. <laughs> and we also got a whole bunch of like um, little collections of books. And there are some science fiction in there, but we, we didn't even get to them this year because of COVID-19. They're still all in my closet um, waiting yeah. for reading circles. So, but it, we also do like um, give kids time to read things of their own choosing during our class. They have to be able to pick something. And I always have those kids that pick science fiction books. Um, I tried to find, uh, help them find them in the library and I encourage them to bring them from home if they have them. Um, as far as our textbooks go, I, I don't actually, I'm not familiar enough with our brand new textbook to tell you very much about what science fiction uh, offerings are available yet. I'm still yeah. learning. Um, but uh, the main novel we read is like fantasy science fiction, the main novel that we read for the year. So that's a lot of fun because it combines them and it's a great story. So it's, it's yeah. the fourth one that we were doing. I don't know when Neil Schusterman came, but uh -huh. oh, yeah, yeah. it's a really good sci-fi fantasy type type story. So the kids really dig that. Yeah. Do, I have a question for you, Miss Alcido. Do you have a favorite author? Oh my gosh. Um, pick a genre. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I have lots of favorite authors, authors, but for different reasons. I'm a huge fan, and I know this is super cliche, J.K. Rowling. Um, yeah. The lady that wrote all the Harry Potter stories is like yeah. one of the most amazing storytellers ever. But um, yeah. I also really like Jane Austen. I know that's also really old, oldie schmoldy. I love Shakespeare. I love theater, like a lot, a lot, a lot. So yeah. I like those things, and I actually also like movie scripts. And my favorite <laughs> movie script of all time is the original Back to the Future. It's like one of the best written scripts of all time. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, here's, a, 
here's an unpopular opinion that I hear all the time, but I'm going to stick to it. And okay. I'll give you my arguments. I often hear people say the book was better than the movie. And I could not disagree anymore. <laughs> now, <laughs> oh, no. every you? time I hear people <laughs> say that, every time I hear people say that, they one, I always think to myself, you're just trying to sound smarter than you really are. But <laughs> <laughs> there, I, I will give you, I will give you that most most of the times the book is a little bit better. But if you're watching the right movies, the movie could be way better than the book. Now, I'll give you like a, a few examples. Okay. The Shining. Uh, I've read The Shining, and The Shining movie is way better. But I which never read you first. Read it or watch it? Watched it. Uh, there you go. Um, the Martian. I have not the, read The Martian or seen it, so I can't. Martian, like, I, I would have, okay, in some instances, Edward, I think you're, I read The Martian, and it's pretty, it, um, it's got a, like a lot of, of vocabulary in there, like like terminology that you have to kind of like look up if you don't know it. And um, yeah. it's really, it's a good book though, but I would say I saw the movie first, then I read The Martian, so, but I did like the movie better than the book. Okay. The Lord of the Rings. <clears throat> Those no. movies are phenomenal. The books are amazing, but the movies were, so it's down to interpretation, right? <laughs> the, point of the, the one thing I always hear about books is that they always say, well, the book is gets so much more into detail, as if detail is a good thing. Sometimes you don't need That's detail. Sometimes, sometimes you just need to like, like when, like in Lord of the Rings, the guy spends like five pages talking about a tree. Like, okay, I get it. Yeah. It's a big tree. There's no need to go into it. I know what a tree looks like. And in the movie, it just shows you. Look, here's a tree. The end. Let's move on. All and right, I think so that's the thing. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say I I, I am gonna get let you in on a little secret here. And you're not allowed to tell Tolkien because, you know, if you ever happen to see him. But um, I used to read the towers in college to help myself go to sleep. Like I literally <laughs> towers and start reading and I would just pass out of sleep because it is. It's very long and detailed and beautiful. But yeah, it, uh, the movies help to kind of like condense the story down. So it's more um, palatable, I guess. I, like, I, I have my agreements with you on this. I love the books, but, you know, that sort of thing. Also, okay, the science fiction books, Michael Crichton, Jurassic Park, anybody? Oh, man, that was a great yeah. book. That's okay, a great, that was a great like movie. Right? right? The, the, the book, movie was great. Movie great. The books are also, I'm like, I'm like, they're like, they're like right here, right? Because I remember seeing those movies as a kid. And oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. I have to go back. I saw the first one as a kid, but The Lost World was coming out like it was coming to theaters when I was like 13. Mm. So I was like, okay, yeah. I'm going to read the book. I'm going to read the book before I see the movie. And I did. And they were they were both pretty darn good. Now, obviously, The Lost World, the movie was a sequel. So it wasn't quite as good as the book or the first movie. But mm. like, he can write. He can write those dinosaur books. Like, I was nightmaring left and right about dinosaurs, sometimes still. I have dreams about raptors chasing me. It is just a thing. But <laughs> Michael Crichton knows how to write. Yeah, but Those I think the one important. movie, the one movie that changed my opinion on books and movies is Two Thousand One: A Space Odyssey. Oh, have wow. you ever seen Two Thousand One? I have. Yes, yeah. I mean, just the opening itself, when you have all like you have the moon, the Earth, and the sun all lined up, and then you have um, mm -hmm. the symphony playing in the background. That to me made me feel like there's no book that can match that. Like, if you think about a, a, a baby being born, if you were to see that on video, or if you were to see a movie or like a documentary of a baby being born, and we're all parents here, we've kind of all experienced that right. to some extent, you cannot read something that will um, do justice what the image looks like when you finally see a newborn baby, or you can't do justice to like a meteor shower or to like a sunset. You can you can have a poet write something, but at the end of the day, there's something that only visuals can tell. Or even like music. Can you imagine seeing a documentary about like the Beatles? Yeah. That there's nothing that a book you can you cannot write a book about the Beatles music because it's not gonna do it justice. You need to hear the music. And that's something that movies allow you to do. They allow you to hear it, they allow you to see it. When you think about the book Jaws. That's great. It could probably scare you, but when you hear the sound of the shark coming your way in the movie, that just automatically gives you an instantaneous like fear. And that's why I think 
if you do, if you get a great director like Spielberg or Kubrick or somebody that's real good, then the movie is better than the book. So <laughs> I'm not going to disagree with you because, because, because like, so you're like Mr. Alvarado, I feel like is my neighbor for a reason. I'm such a theater movie nerd. Um, and when I was in high school, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a movie director. I, uh, surprise. I didn't want to be an English teacher, but anyway, <laughs> um, I studied movies so much and I, I agree with you on a level, but it's almost like, it's like we're comparing um, two different types of apples almost. Like they're both the same kind of fruit, but they offer you different flavors. Because books, if it's a really well-written book, they can create so many of those things just in your mind. And I guess it depends on the reader too. Like you have to have that kind of mindset going into a book that you can create that world in your head. And that's where I think that when people read the book first and then see the movie, they've imagined it their own way. So sometimes the movie is a letdown just on a personal level because they've imagined it a certain way. However, like with movies, you hit a lot more of the senses. Instead of just reading and interpreting mentally, you're able to hit the eyes, hit the ears, like you're able to get all that in. So really, like you said, because there's also crappy movies. And so like yeah. the ones that aren't, yeah. well aren't well directed and don't have the right music, you know what I mean? So. I think you're on the. I, I I agree, but I disagree. I don't know how do how do I say that. <laughs> I'm I'm glad you agree with me. Keep that up. I, you, have you? <laughs> I'm telling have you. Have you finally come to my side? <laughs> but but see, Miss Alcina made a great point about when you create the movie in your mind as you read it. You you have your own um, vision of what the character may look like. Um, because when they describe them, obviously they're okay. not detailed specific they'll give you some kind of like with blondish you know glaring hair or something you hear something like that and then you imagine that in your own mind and so that's the that's exactly right because if you read the book first and you've created this movie in your head and then you go see the movie and you're like well that's not the way i saw it when yeah you're going to be disappointed on a personal level um yeah. so i agree 100 percent. also i okay so here's another example like i've seen movies too and then read the book like the martian um, right now, I I saw the TV show Altered Carbon on Netflix, and I'm reading the book now. And I can tell you that, again, the book, I'm reading the book, and I keep trying to, and, and I keep getting, like, this feedback from the, from the movie that I saw. And I'm like, no, that's not how, <laughs> they're different. And they're different. And so when I'm reading the book, I already have, it's already been created for me, like, who the guy is and what he looks like. And so you have that inter you kind of have that interference. You're like, so I I get what you're saying. I mean, I think cinematography, like the movies, they 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 create what it should look like. But um, uh, music again, like music makes movies epic. I mean, yeah. Hans yeah. Zimmer, um, you know, like the Jurassic Park, who wrote the composer, compo uh, what's that guy? He did a lot. E. T. He did. Um, Jurassic Park. What's his name? Um, it's not Hans Zimmer. No, wait. No, Hans um, Zimmer was Interstellar, and um, but but this guy that well, anyhow, but the like like Superman. Well, that's me now. Like those <laughs> those uh, the composers that make the music for these movies. Those that's another again. That's a whole different thing too, because music can make a movie um, as well. Um, right. And if you don't have the right music and the right composer, I mean. You know, it could be a, it, it couldn't, it may not be as epic as it, it could have been because music does make that much of a difference. But um, I would say um, that, John yeah, Williams. there are some John movies Williams. that are better John than the Williams. book. <laughs> I was looking it up. Yeah, me too. I'm like, who was that guy? <laughs> who was it? John Williams. John Williams. Yeah. There you go. Yes. Yeah. That guy has written some, I mean, some That's really, it, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. So those, those, that, again, that's like a whole nother aspect of like the the movies like you have to have the right music and then with the right uh director like a spielberg and holy moly can you make a great yeah. movie oh yeah so are there books that you can read that have like a soundtrack with them like has that ever been done before where they say here here's um like whenever you turn to page 12 push this button or like push play and then you'll hear the music while you're reading has that been done before not that I know of, so maybe you shouldn't broadcast this, cast this on the internet. You should like <laughs> and like market it <laughs> because that's brilliant. That's really brilliant. Like because you're you're right, music can well. And when I read, I play music in the background anyway. Yeah. Um, 
Like, I bet you guys do stuff like that too. When you, when you're doing things, you're like, I need this kind of music in the background for this yeah. activity or this task. Yeah. Reading could be one of those and that would be really cool. And I think the kids would love that. I would love that. So yeah, that's cool. I've yeah. Like, like imagine reading like a Stephen King novel and then like putting some like creepy music in the background. <laughs> like, that would probably... <laughs> I'll do that I make my kids journal. I'll be like, here's the, and if it's like a creepy prompt, I'll play creepy music and they'll be like, Miss, this music is creepy. I'm like, well, the prompt is creepy. Yeah. <laughs> it goes together. <laughs> so no, that's a brilliant idea. I love that. I'm gonna have to try to find a way to make that work. Then I'll I'll give you credit, Mr. So in in the in the in the, <laughs> in the Lord of the Rings books and like the Hobbit, they actually have um like the songs, they write them in script, like in the book, you can read them, but like yeah. you have to kind of play that. You can you read it and you gotta like kind of make up, I guess, your own rhyme how it goes. <laughs> I was not disappointed in that soundtrack. Like I loved being able to hear how they interpreted the music in the in the Hobbit and yeah. in the Lord of the Rings. That it's was good. awesome. So yeah, it was good. It was good. I liked it. So science is all about like a process. Like um, whenever we do labs in the background, we have to follow a process. We have to follow the steps. Or if you just have um, a theory, you have to go through the scientific process. Right. Now when it comes to stories um are you allowed to break um or do you would you say it's okay for your students to break the writing process because i know there's a process to writing as well is that allowed because in science it's not really allowed in science you can say oh i'm gonna look at the data first and then ask a question because <laughs> then your question's going to be biased on the data or you can say well i'm gonna add, i'm gonna ask a question and then I'm going to give the data and then I'm going to research it. Like, well, you can't do that. Like with science, you have to stick with the order or your final uh, conclusion is not going to make any sense or it's going to be biased or it's going to be altered in some way that's not legitimate. But in, uh, when you're, when you're storytelling, are you allowed to do that? You know, that's, that's such an interesting way to put it. There's always a process to how people put things together um obviously like the writing process for an essay is completely different than a writing process for a story so story writing is interesting because like you kind of pointed out there's a lot more freedom to it and what i would say is this i think that with writing a story because there are writers who even break the rules of grammar like full out like i've read something where there is no punctuation which is slightly um maddening like i have ocd so <laughs> but like <laughs> don't have to follow and, and i mean he's a legit writer like he has books published but it just um depends on what you're trying to accomplish and the one thing i feel like when anyone's writing a story whether it's a novelist or a student or a teacher is if you create rules in your story you can't break the rules you created in your story because if you do you lose your reader and that's the one thing that i think storytellers don't want to do they don't want to lose their reader so much that the reader goes okay i don't understand what's happening anymore I'm lost, I, what, eh, Schmidt, and they'll put it aside. So if you create, like, that's how magical books and science fiction books function. They have made their own rules in their book and they have to follow those rules. Not necessarily like the structure rules of telling a story, but they have to follow their rules that they made. Otherwise, you don't have a good story. So then what about like non-linear storytelling? Like, um, how do you feel about stories that jump from like, past to present to just are all over the place. What, what is the point of that? Why not just tell a story the way it played out? Um, I find them interesting and I don't know why people do it. Come to think of it, I've never really considered that. I've just like read them and you know, you read linear stories, you read non-linear stories and uh, depending on how they break it up, I think that sometimes it lends to the ending. Like maybe if they're trying to surprise you in some way, I think that's why they maybe jump back and forth. Also, sometimes it's a really cool way for at the end as a reader to like put things together. If you're like, oh, that's what they were talking about at the beginning. Like if they start with the end of the beginning, sort of, and then jump yeah. back and forth all the way through the story. And then at the end, it all ties together. It's kind of like an aha moment, but I don't know why they do that. That's a good question. I've never tried to write a story that way. Um, I think it would be hard. Yeah. Personally, but I think it's really cool when people do that or when they break it up so that it's different characters. Like telling a story, that's another non-linear, like where it's like, well, chapter one is Mr. Solis's chapter, chapter two is Mr. Quintero's, like they'll do it that way too. And it's the same story, but different perspectives. And I think that's really neat too, because then you catch different things. So yeah, I just think it's neat. Yeah. I think it's interesting. Yeah. Things up. 
So right now in science, we're talking about cells. We're talking about the difference between animal cells and plant cells. Can you think of any stories in science, or I guess even any movies that deal with like the human body and cells that students would find interesting right now that maybe they'd like to read? Other than maybe the magic school bus, because I think we've all seen that episode. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh, the magic school bus. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think. Uh, I know that. Um, so the closest thing I can think of are maybe stories that relate to genetics, maybe, um, but they don't usually go into like. Does it ever bother you when you see a movie or a story that's scientifically inaccurate, but it like it plays well with the story, but in reality it doesn't make any sense? Well, yes, actually, that does bother me. <laughs> with history, like when things like try to get it right and then they don't get it right, that does bug me. Does it bug you? Like, yeah, one of the it it depends on like what the story is. Like sometimes I'll be like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Um, <laughs> like there was this movie by Scarlett Johansson a couple of years ago where she supposedly only uses like 4% of her brain and then she keeps on getting more and more. Like she takes some magic pill or something and now she can use 50% of her brain or 60% and then she becomes like this godlike figure. And I was like, that's not the way the brain works. Like we use 100% of it, we just don't use it all at once. But it's not like we only use like one inch of our brain and the rest is dead. It's like, no, I mean, if you've seen CAT scans, we use the whole thing, but one part is for memory, one part is, but they try to get away with it by saying like, well, she's only using like 5% of her potential. And it's like, no, that doesn't make any sense. Like, it's not like if you use more of it, you're gonna get smarter. It, so that one really bothered me. Yeah. Or like some science fiction movies where like, um, like Star Wars when they go to another planet and they can breathe the air or the gravity right. is just like Earth. And I'm like, that doesn't, why would all the gravity be the same, just like Earth? Like the gravities are always okay. Everybody speaks English. <laughs> yeah, it just makes it easier for George Lucas's storytelling. It's a movie, Edward, it's a movie. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that, that, that kind of annoys me. I think it depends when it comes on how they get you to suspend your belief. You know what I mean? Like yeah. we all know the Jurassic Park can't happen, but somehow they like convince us to suspend our belief for that. Yeah. But like you said, maybe some of those movies just aren't good at convincing us to suspend yeah. our belief system. You know what I mean? Well, Jurassic Park is a good example of cells because that's how they bring the dinosaurs back, right? Yeah, well, in DNA, I wasn't sure if like that all kind of goes together or not. I'm not a scientist. It does, yeah. <laughs> it, no, it does, it does. Yeah. Okay. We learn, we learn about the nucleus and the DNA and, um, and how it's the control center for the cells and that's, but it does, it does combine. And it's interesting because um, I remember um, reading the book and then watching the movie. And then I thought, I thought, wow, that in my mind, I thought at the time, I thought, man, is that a possibility? Like, <laughs> they really, you're kind of thinking like, wow, that would be cool, right? If they could actually do that. And, 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 then, they, and then they find a frozen willy mammoth <laughs> you know, in, in Russia. And then I read articles where they're talking about, you know, possibly, um, cloning it um, with all the DNA that they've collected and blah, blah, blah. And then I thought, holy cow, that that could possibly happen. Um, I mean, but again, uh, it, it's interesting the, uh, how the cells work and especially now with what's going on with Corona and all that. But uh, um, yeah, the so Jurassic Park's a good a good example of that because in the movie, remember, they show you that example about the cells and how it works. And Yeah. Well, and if it's uh, so if we go on a more loose scale, kind of like that, anything that works with like genetics. So anything that had to do with the Holocaust, because basically that came down to um, them trying to mess with human genetics. Mm -hmm. um, and so like Number the Stars is a really good book. If if my students haven't read that book, that's like right around their, their reading level. And it's about the Holocaust. It doesn't necessarily go into cells, but that was the whole point of the Holocaust was the Nazis were trying to manipulate you know, human genetics. And then, um, sorry, Jurassic Park. There's one, one, there was one more in my brain. Where'd it go? Oh my gosh, I'll think of it. Wait, what, did you think, what, what did you say that book was called? It's called Number of the Stars. Um, and that's- Number the Stars? Everyone thinks of Anne Frank. Um, Number of the Stars is a really good, it's by Lois Lowry. And that's a really good Holocaust book. Um, it's like at a fifth, sixth grade level. And then there's also um, a book that was in my library. It was called Resistance. And it's about a girl working with the resistance during the Holocaust. So that's a little bit more like action adventure style. 
and I can't remember the author's name. Gosh, it'll come to me eventually. But yeah, like Holocaust themed books have to do with what was going on then. There was another thing though. Um, I think Neil no. Schuster has some other books that have to do with um, trying to manipulate human society in a similar way, but like in a more science fiction style way that hasn't happened. Yeah. Um, and so they can look at a great number of his sorts of books because he tends to focus on fantasy sci-fi style stuff. Um, and I honestly haven't read all of his books. I just know that he kind of goes with that theme. So if they looked up Neil Schusterman, the author, there's more really good books. And his books are like fast paced, interesting, um, you don't want to put them down kind of books. So that would be good. There was something else though, and I'll think of it. I'll tell you if I do. Sorry, my mind wanders. So. <laughs> what, what's Number the Stars about? Number of the Stars is actually about um, two families in, during World War II. It's been a long time since I read it, so bear with me. But basically, um, during the time when they're rounding up all the Jews, there's a family that, of Jewish people that basically tries to have their daughter go stay with non-Jewish people. I believe this takes place in Poland. Yeesh, I hope. I haven't read it in a while. <clears throat> but basically, they try to get the, the little girl to um, be camouflaged into their family, to save her from being rounded up and sent off like the rest of her family has been. And unfortunately, she doesn't look like them. Like she has dark hair instead of like the blonde hair like the rest of the family. And the Nazis are hunting her down. And so they're trying to prove that this little girl belongs with their family. And they do it by <clears throat> giving her the identity of one of their daughters that passed away. It's kind of, it's like um, kind of sad. They eventually are able to help her escape Nazi, oh, I just gave it away. But, um, <laughs> spoiler <laughs> alert. <Bye. laughs> oh my gosh. I, I just, I need more coffee. <laughs> so, and this is a fifth grade book? That sounds kind of intense for fifth grade. Well, and you know what's really weird is um, I became interested in the Holocaust because of this book. And I remember reading it in the fifth grade. Like, I remember my fifth grade teacher, I remember the book. And then, um, when I was first a teacher, it, I was an eighth grade teacher when I first started, but I taught in an extremely um, low, what, what do you call it, like low income, high need area. And yeah. the levels were very, very low. And we read that book together as a class. We also read The Giver, which is another really cool book, sci-fi book. So did you guys read The Giver? I never no. read The Giver. No. Another Lois Lowry book. That's I remember another. kids. I remember kids reading it um, in middle school. Like, oh, I remember seeing them with it, but I, I never... I've never read that. The Giver is like give? the the Giver is pretty. It's actually by the same author. Now that I think about it, she was a busy lady at some point. Lois Lowry. <laughs> <laughs> the Giver is interesting. It's like a um, oh, what do they call it? A dystopian society. It's like trying to be a utopia, but it's actually kind of warped. And so um, it has to do with this young man named Jonas. And when you reach a certain age, you um, get your you basically get your jobs given to you. And he becomes like the apprentice of the giver, who's this very main person in their society. Um, and it kind of follows how that, it's, it's very unusual, but I don't know how to describe it. It really sucks you into their little world. It's got its own rules. Um, it reminds me of Schusterman a little bit. Like they make all their own little rules about their world and how it works. And it's very different from how our world works. Um, so Jonas has to figure out how to make peace with his new job he's been given and whether or not he can even do it. Um, and it gets a little dark here and there, you know. Kids but what like is what is what does the giver give? That's a good question. You should read it and find out. <laughs> <laughs> no spoiler <laughs> alert. I already spoiled one book. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> spoil alerts by Mrs. Salcedo. <laughs> Warning on this video. There you go. You, you can have your own podcast where you just bring people on and we'll spoil movies and well, books. Well, and I'm such a hypocrite. Like when um, Avengers movies were coming out, when uh, Endgame finally came out, I didn't get to see it right away. And my kids would be like, Miss, have you seen it? I was like, I was like, don't tell me anything. La, 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 la. <laughs> yeah. No spoilers. <laughs> so. so why do you think that, have you ever cried reading a book? Because I've cried watching a movie before, especially now more as a dad than I ever have. Like I remember seeing movies as a kid and being like, oh, that was a good movie. And then I see them now as a dad and I'm just like in tears, like, oh my God, it's so different now being a parent seeing it. Yeah. Uh, why do you think we cry when we see movies or read books? Like we know it's fake, so why do we cry? Uh, empathy. I think that 
based on our personal experiences, like you said, being a parent. So things that didn't make me cry before I was a parent make me cry now, but it has to do with that, that feeling you get like if that was my kid. Have you guys read or watched, it's a movie and a book, The Road? Yes. Oh, I love the movie. The movie's way better. Go ahead. Oh my God. <laughs> tears, tears and tears and tears in that movie. Like just seeing the things that they had to go through. I cried yeah. so much and I tried to start to read the book and I, I couldn't read it. Like I could not finish reading it because it was too emotional. Um, my best friend is also a teacher. Weirdly, she was an English major, but she's a math teacher. I don't know what happened there. But um, so she reads a lot, a lot, a lot. And she was reading this book and she called me. I'm not even joking a week ago. She goes, okay, so I'm reading this book. And it's like 500 pages long, but I'm on like page 350 and something horrible just happened. And I just started crying and crying and crying. And I, I don't know if I can keep reading it. I was like, okay, so don't keep reading it. <laughs> and she was like, it's so bad. Like, it's so bad that it's so sad. I can't even tell you what happened because I don't want to inflict that sadness. I was like, okay. I said, does the book belong to you? She goes, yeah, like, I don't know what to do with it. I was like, throw it away <laughs> like, <laughs> it. If you can't read it anymore and it belongs to you just get rid of it i was like i've had to do that before with books like <laughs> i know that's weird but i guess if you can't like sometimes if you can't handle it just just get rid of it it, it happens you know so one uh one movie that i saw this was maybe back in 2004 i believe uh, okay. it's a movie called godsend and it's about um some parents who their eight-year-old son dies he gets like run over or something and then um they say some doctor says we can actually like get his cells and we can um like clone him and then you can have your kid back and they say okay and then they do that but then when he turns like eight years old he starts to like get sick or something like when he gets back to the age that he died and he starts to, it, it gets really weird, but basically like the whole idea, spoiler alert, is that um, <laughs> <laughs> like he can't live past his age that he died because he's not like meant to live longer than that. Um, so even though it was a freak accident, like the universe won't allow him to go to age nine. So they kind of go through the suffering all over again. Um, nope. So I guess my question to both of you would be, do you think that would be ethical to do to, clone somebody who just died so they can live again no 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 i agree no why not i think i think you're playing god when you do that and and um i just think that you know why why would you want to clone but your aren't child you playing god with the vaccine aren't you saying hey look um nature created this and man we're gonna find a way to get around it so Aren't you playing God when you say, well, we're going to have women be allowed to have C-sections? Like, that's not the way babies were supposed to be born. Aren't you playing God when you say, hey, we're going to have, yeah, like, you're, you're, creating, you're creating a life um, through, like, okay, it's a scientific, uh, you know, process. It's, a, it's something that was developed through science, but you're, you're creating a child to fill an empty void that, of an experience that you had as opposed to, um, like living life experience. I mean, in my opinion, it's wrong. And I, I, I guess I imagine some people might say, yeah, but if, if science lets us do it, then we should be able to, because there's people that agree with that, that, you know, well, if the technology is there, we should be able to do it. But, um, you know, you, I just think it would be just weird in, and, and just, uh, I don't know. Maybe don't, you, don't you think that a hundred years ago, people would have said, what do you mean you're going to freeze your eggs and then have a baby later on in life with a man you've never met? That's weird. That's not natural. That goes up against God. Like, how are you going to freeze your eggs and then go to a sperm bank and get, like, sperm, and now you're going to create a baby with somebody you've never even met? That goes up against God. That's weird. But now we see that today, and we're like, well, that's just perfectly normal. If somebody wants to do that, if they want to have a kid, there's nothing wrong with that. So why would it not be perfectly normal to say, yeah, my my – my daughter or my son died five years ago, but I kind of want them back. So I'm going to go make, have them made again so I can get them back. That, that's just that. So you're talking about like, well, that would be weird a hundred years ago. But the thing is that when people freeze their eggs, they do it for, uh, if they, if those are the people I think that they know that they may have issues. I'm not sure on, I'm, I'm speaking right on this, but I thought, that it was for mainly people who might have a problem giving birth later or something like that. I don't know. And so they do that. 
so that way maybe they can have a child. Um, but I don't think they just do it just to do it. I don't know. But um, again, it's it's an it's a, like a life experience. I think people um, maybe they're they're so traumatized by it and they want to fill that empty void that they would do something like that. I think that's what it comes down to. Not not as opposed to like it's opposed to saying, hey, you know what? These, this was a hand I was dealt. Um, I have grief. And I lived through that experience. And, and if I want another child, I have to have another child and see how that goes. I mean, that's how I kind of look at it. Well, and not only that, but it's almost a question of mixing ethics with science or ethics with, with um, faith. Because um, it depends on your faith system, your belief system as well. That's the thing. Yeah. And that's such a personal thing um, that when you say that it's normal, I, I live in contemporary society. Last time I checked, I lived in co contemporary society. And like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes I'm like, maybe I'm from another time. I don't know. <laughs> but like, as far as like those, the things you brought up, Mr. Solis, I don't see them as being natural whatsoever, but that comes down to my belief system and my faith in God. And so yeah. that, that's where that gets a little hazy because it depends on how people believe. So personally, as far as the, the child question and like bringing someone back, that comes down to um, your belief in what happens to people who are dead and what their condition is and what the future might hold for that person. And so that's where I think it gets hazy. And that's why I think some people make different choices than other people in that situation. I wouldn't do it. Um, I have faith that I will see my loved ones who have passed on again. And that faith is very strong. So I would hope that it's strong enough that I wouldn't feel the need to try to bring them back in this present world. I can look forward instead of trying to bring something back in the present. Does that make sense? Sort of. Yeah. What about, what about somebody who maybe they get in a car accident and they say, Hey, they're like, they're dead. But if we jumpstart them again, I don't know what it's called. What are those things called where they go? Uh, Defib defib defibrillator. defibrillator. No, is that what it is? Yeah, defibrillators, yeah. Yeah, what if they say, well, we can bring them back. Would you want us to do that? Like, isn't that, the time scale is different because it just happened, but they say they've been dead for one minute. We can do the defibrillator and then they pop back into existence. How is that any different from saying, well, they've been dead for five years, we can bring them back? Oh my gosh, that's a big difference, that word. <laughs> the oranges. Right? Like mummies back to life. I don't really want to do that either. <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> We're going to talk about zombies soon. Is that what's coming? The 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 uh, the what I get is that so if you say we can clone someone, right? Like I'm going to clone my child. Once you start crossing those lines, then then you're opening the door to um i think scientific experimentation with humans and different things like like why you're just opening up pandora's box man i mean you then you're gonna say well if you're allowing this then why can't we do this well if you're allowing this then why can't we do this because that's how it works and so i think with science you have to have a line there that then that's why they have scientific boards that that create these um you know um i guess reg not i guess kind of like regulations or um, they create advice for the, the world about, you know, this is what you should not be doing. This is not allowed. This is unethical. Because I think once you cross certain boundaries, um, how do you stop it? I mean, how do you, you know, well, like, like experimentation, again, experimentation with humans. Um, is, is it going to be acceptable to experiment on them with science and create? I mean, not, I'm not saying create like a super being. I'm talking about, um, like, I want to know what happens if I inject this in a human. Then yeah. why isn't that okay then? And then I you believe all read Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Old <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That's one for your kids. Manipulating uh, cells. That's Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. She wrote it when she was 19 years old. Did y'all know that? No. I did not know that. She was 19. I read that when I was like 21 in college. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've been wasting my life. <laughs> wrote this book at 19 and she's still famous like what have i been doing <laughs> i saw the movie uh frank and weenie about the little bit oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, that would be such a fun like read the frankenstein book and then read like watch frank and weenie and then like compare them. <laughs> that would be really fun you guys remind me of jeff goblum in uh jurassic park when he says your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could they never stopped to think if they should his Character is like one of my most favorite characters in movies. I love that character, <laughs> Malcolm. Oh, you know, you want to see him in a crazy, gross scientific movie? Watch The Fly. I think that was in the oh, 19th. Yeah. 
Oh okay. my gosh. That is a, he is, it gets creepy at the end, especially when he's transforming. <laughs> yeah. Now, I think I'm the exact opposite. I'm, I'm all for opening Pandora's box and seeing how far <laughs> down the rabbit hole goes. We'll see you on the other side, Mr. Solis. Yeah. <laughs> because I, I agree I with you. Like, limits, Edward. I have my limits. What? I think there's a boundary between. Uh, you I, see, I don't think so. I don't think there's a boundary. I think that if you were to go back 500 years and let them know what we're doing now, they would say, you guys have crossed the line. They'd say, what are you talking about? Like, you're allowed to, like, like even, like, some of the stuff that's on TV, they're saying, like, how can you show this to children? How can, like, music, how can these lyrics be allowed for, like, a 12-year-old to hear? Uh, they would say, like, we're living an unethical life. Then you talk about medicine, and they would say, like, there's a reason why people get sick and die, but you guys are creating vaccines to save people. That goes up against what was supposed to happen. Let these people die, or even, like, People who are older, they're like, hey, they live their life. But now with medical science, people who should have died a long time ago, they're staying like a lot, like <laughs> they're living. I think they would look at us now and say, what well, you guys are doing, you, you've crossed the line. But for us, we're like, no, it's just normal. So all the stuff that I'm talking about, like what we've talked about in the past, like designer babies, or we talked about like bringing back somebody you love that they died. Like it seems really foreign to us and say, that's crazy. But I'm pretty sure that 200, 300 years from now, where stuff like that is happening, they're going to say, yeah, it's no big deal. Yeah, my son died two years ago, but he's back. Like, he's died like five times. It doesn't matter. You are assigning thoughts to people that existed two or 300 years ago. You, like, <laughs> that you couldn't be more wrong about that. So... <laughs> <laughs> And the podcast is over. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. Okay. So hear me out. Hear me out. Okay. So yes. 300 years ago, people were still people just like we're people now. They just had different versions of this sort of thing. And so the thing is, people still had trouble coping with death. They didn't just go, oh, shmeh, she died, whatever. Like they had different ways of coping. <laughs> And so I don't know, um, ugh, I took this horrible class called uh, Literature and Medicine, where I read all these different books about um, that are about people who are sick and about people who are going through illness and dying, um, either written about them or by them. And part of it is that hundreds of years ago, things were just a little bit different belief system wise. So they still had to find a way to cope. They believed a lot more in spiritism. They still tried to talk to dead level. So they did things that are weird to us, just like, are you saying that this might be weird to them? But I don't think unheard of because some people like the mortality rate was so hot back then. They yeah. wanted to see their dead loved ones and they did all kinds of weird stuff. Have y'all ever seen a Victorian um, corpse photography? Like they would prop up their dead loved one and have a last photograph with them. They had um, ghost photography where they make it look like these people were ghosts in pictures. They did a lot of weird stuff to cope with this as well. That we would That's go, kind of oh my gosh, like, what are they doing? Why would they pose with their dead mom in a photo? Like they make them look alive. It's you should Google yeah. it. It's worth a Google. But um, like they had <laughs> a way of coping with this stuff that is super weird to us. And I think that science was always trying to move this direction. They just didn't have the same technology we do. Like they were open up, opening up bodies. They were trying to figure out uh, how to, like Frankenstein was written when? In like the early 1800s? Oh my gosh, I'd have to look back. It's either the late 1700s or early 1800s. It's a book about putting body parts together to create a human being. So people were thinking of this it just wasn't possible yet. So I disagree with you, Mr. Solis. I think that people were totally trying to figure this stuff out. See, but now the key word wasn't possible yet, but now it is. Right. <laughs> and there will always be people who agree with it and always people who disagree with it. Yeah. Right? Well, it looks like we're coming to the tail end. We're about 45 minutes in. This uh, has probably been one of the darkest podcasts we've done. <laughs> Talking about death and well, I picked the right the Holocaust. <laughs> oh, look, look at that! Got my like Chamberlain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I usually put this out on Facebook and I like give a little description about what this is about, and it's gonna be kind of weird to say we talked about the Holocaust and death. But... <laughs> <laughs> and we had a great time doing it. <laughs> it was yeah. it was good talk about science and literature. It was good. Yeah. It, yeah. It so, was. Um, is there anything that? You want to say to uh, the students, Miss Osito? Gosh, um, 
I can't believe that this is how the school year is ending. And I wish it wasn't like I miss seeing my kids and I wish I could like say bye to them in person like usual. So I guess um, I want my students to know that I miss them and I can't wait to see them again next year. So and y'all better visit me since I don't get to see you to next year. So that's for my students. Yeah. Nice. Quintero, anything you want to say? Um, yeah, I just again, like I miss my kids. Um, if you're watching this, make sure you do your online work. <laughs> and uh, I mean, yeah, like Ms. Saseo said, I mean, it, it's we don't have that formal goodbye. So hopefully they'll be able to come by and visit us and say hi um, and then clean. And it, it's so it's one of those things. But, yeah, we do miss them and I miss them and uh, we'll see them soon. It'll it'll go. It'll be different, but we'll see them. Okay, and I just want to say that any movie or book we recommended, ask your parents before you see it. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> and um, watch Netflix before you read the book. That's what I would tell them. <laughs> <laughs> Do it at the same time. Read the book and what? No. <laughs> <laughs> and I will see you next week, students. All right. Thank you guys so much. Bye, students.